Hello everyone, can you guys hear me? Hello, okay, good. Do I sound okay? Yes. Okay, well, happy Friday, everyone. Um, does this does the PowerPoint look blurry at all? It looks a little blurry to me, but I don't know if it looks okay to you guys. No, okay, so it's just me. Um, sorry, I'm on my Mac today, so it's <laughs> it's always so odd when I switch my setup. But happy Friday um, and happy Halloween for those of you who are going to be, you know, doing some sort of celebration for it. Um, I will not be, but it is my favorite holiday. But I, I, yeah, no, not this year. 2020 is not the year. So we have some things that we need to cover today. So let's go ahead and get started. It's quite a bit of you on the call today. All right. So here's our agenda. We're going to briefly go over our examination outline. We do have a, a nationwide recall and then chapter one, infection prevention and control programs. Okay, so this is where we are as far with the group. We've done identification of infectious disease processes, surveillance and epidemiologic investigation, preventing and controlling the transmission of infectious agents, employee and occupational health. Um, and for those of you who are not aware, I do have um, quizzes or tests um, that are kind of like, they're kind of like, um, they're not in the same setup that APIC would ask you questions. There's true or false and there's, it's a little bit of a different setup, but it still is testing your knowledge on employee and occupational health. Um, it, that's going to be the week 15 quiz, which is available in the Google Drive and you can print out the PDF and then there's an answer key. Obviously, take the quiz first. <laughs> and then look at the answer key, okay? Because um, you're only playing yourself if you don't do that. All right, so we're starting management and communication. As you can see, we're about halfway through with our lessons. So this is around the time when I start encouraging my group members to make sure they're signing up for their CIC exam. Nothing is going to make you study harder than signing up for that exam. Once you pay your $375 to Civic, to the certification board, that is that commitment. You have committed to taking the test. So please, um, I know we're in the middle of a pandemic and you may say right now is not the time, um, but you know, it's probably not gonna be a good time for the next couple of months. So if it's something that you're really passionate about and you've already been preparing, highly recommend that you go ahead and register. All right, so management and communication. We're in week 16, so some of the chapters assigned uh, assigned readings for week 16 are chapter one, infection prevention and control programs, chapter two, competency and certification of the infection preventionist, legal issues and staffing. So I always get lots of questions about um, this part here. What is that? So when I first developed this, uh, certification study guide and workbook. It was based off the actual published APIC text, um, which was published back in 2014. So this is, these are the actual pages. Uh, if you have access to the electronic APIC text, then these pages, these page numbers might don't really make sense to you, but this is what they're there for. I know I get that question a lot. All right, so let's talk about what came out this week. All right. This is gonna be brief, because um, we obviously have a lot to cover. But this was posted on the FDA website on October 28th, so earlier this week, and I did try to get it out to all of you as soon as possible um, so that you could make sure that you reached out to your pharmacy in case this was a concern. So Sunstar America um, incorporated issues, voluntary nationwide recall of Parax, chlorhexidine, gluconate oral rinse, 0.12% due to microbial contamination. So for those of you, is there anybody who has not seen this? Is this your first time seeing it? I'm hoping some of you would, will have seen this by now. Let's see. And for those of you who are new today, um, 
please remember you just have to type in the questions box to participate. Okay, good. So a lot of you saw it, fantastic. That's what I wanted to hear. So the company announced it on the 27th, the FDA published it on the 28th. Sunstar America Incorporated is voluntarily recalling Parax chlorhexidine gluconate oral rinse, um, bearing an expiration date from 6-30-22 to 9-30-22 to the consumer level. This product may be contaminated with the bacteria Burkholderia lata. Use of the defective product in the immunocompetent host may result in oral and potentially systemic infections requiring antibacterial therapy. In the most at risk populations, the use of the defective product may result in life threatening infections such as pneumonia and bacteremia. To date, no adverse events have been reported to SAI related to this recall. So this is what the announcement looked like. Looked like. Now let's talk about Burkholderia cepatia complex. So as an infection preventionist, one of the things that you want to that you want to um, keep in mind is that you want to be aware of different types of microbial pathogens, the harm that they can cause to patients, staff, um, and their involvement with environmental contamination. So if you're an IP and you come across a Burkholderia on your um, infection prevention work list, right? Some of you use Epic, some of you use Cerner, other, other people use all different types of EMR systems. You should know um, hey, mm, I probably should not be seeing Burkholderia um, in my intensive care unit in a non-cystic fibrosis patient, right? Um, I know that this is an opportunistic infection and I probably shouldn't be seeing it. So it should immediately cause a little bit of an alarm, right? Just seeing a Burkholderia. And you should want to look into that. You should want to look at what's going on. Are there any other potential cases? Um, is this just a one-off? You know, you you should have an understanding of, of these pathogens. The same way that if you've had a patient that has been in your healthcare facility for two weeks, and all of a sudden you have a positive Legionella pneumophila result, you should be um, concerned, right? So what chapters um, discuss Burkholderia? Pharmacy services, environmental gram-negative bacilli, Legionella pneumophila, that should be italicized, I apologize, water system issues, and prevention of um, waterborne um, pathogens. So, personally for me, whenever I come across something that I may not be familiar with, one of the first places I go to is the APIC text of infection control. Um, it has been my, you know, it has been my most used resource as a healthcare associated infections epidemiologist working for the Florida Department of Health and as an infection preventionist. It is invaluable. It is fantastic. It is something that you should have access to if you work in the field of HAIs. So I just wanted to quickly touch on chapters where they cover this. And I know that we discussed pharmacy services already um, and, and it was discussed in that chapter. All right, so Burkholderia cepatia complex. B. cepatia can be found in soil and water. These bacteria are often resistant to common antibiotics, essentially meaning that they have intrinsic resistance. Um, so their patterns do tend to be a bit more resistant than just your, um, than your other garden variety bacteria. It is an opportunistic infection. So B. cepatia was considered to be Pseudomonas cepatia when it was first isolated in patients with cystic fibrosis in 1977. As many of you know, what is my favorite bacteria? <laughs> Let's see if I have any buddy who knows. Joyce, good job. Joyce is like Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Yes, so I love Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is my, yeah, my absolute favorite. So it's so interesting because it was um, initially classified as a Pseudomonas cepatia um, prior to, you know, further um, um, microbiological testing and all of that good stuff to, to further um, classify it. So let's talk about this classification. There's this really wonderful paper that was published earlier in uh, earlier in 2020. Genome-based classification of Burkholderia cepatia complex provides new insights into its taxonomic status. Now, this paper is dense. Um, it's it's quite dense. There's there's quite a bit that I don't understand specifically because I don't come from a laboratory background. So there's definitely some things that I am not um, that just kind of go over my head, and that is okay to admit. 
but it does hold some really good information about um, Burkholderia cepatia complex in general that is good for an infection preventionist to know. So accurate classification of the different Burkholderia cepatia complex species is essential for therapy, prognosis, assessment, and research. The taxonomic status of BCC remains problematic and an improved knowledge about the classification of BCC is in particular need. And this is something that you will see. So um, when you conduct a literature review on Burkholderia and you're looking at um, different instances or outbreaks that it's been associated with, you'll see that. They mention that, that it can be difficult to speciate it um, and that we, we do need a lot more research in this area. So hopefully we'll have more research coming out regarding Burkholderia. BCC is a group of gram-negative bacteria comprising more than 20 valid species, including B. cepatia, B. multivorans, Cenocepatia, etc. There's literally so many fun names with, um, with Burkholderia. So what are some key facts that we need to know? B. cepatia complex organisms are associated with accelerated decline in pulmonary functions, increasing morbidity and mortality, and reducing the survival following lung transplantation. Patients infected with BCC bacteria may develop syndromes associated with septicemia, which is associated with high mortality. BCC is noted for its different resistance mechanisms, which confer non-susceptibility to most of the available antibiotics, making infections very difficult to eradicate. And outbreaks of different BCC species are often reported, and there is a large body of evidence showing that BCC bacteria are capable of patient-to-patient -patient spread. So those are some of the key facts that we need to know as infection preventionists. Um, and just for funsies, let's throw up some of the, the recent, you know, outbreaks that have been reported. There was a multi-state outbreak of Burkholderia cepatia complex bloodstream infections after exposure to contaminated saline flush syringes. Um, another uh, outbreak of intrinsically contaminated chlorhexidine mouthwashes. So we can see that this bacteria does cause issues. Um, depending on the articles, on the journal articles you read, um, there has been documentation of them um, forming biofilm within pharmacies, um, water filtration systems. So there's a lot of really good um, research and, and knowledge that is available to you. So I wanted just to briefly touch on Burkholderia before we went on, and we're going to be moving on now. So are there any questions before we start our chapter one for today? Okay, I'm not seeing any questions in the, the chat box. So let's get going. So today we're talking about infection prevention and control programs. Infection prevention and control programs are affected by professional and nonprofit organizations, government, regulatory and accrediting agencies and scientific research and publications. So I know this is just one really brief <laughs> bullet point, but it encompasses a lot of the work and organizations that we collaborate with. Uh, so we know our professional organizations that, that we are going to for infection prevention, is, it's, it's quite a large umbrella, um, but most often um, some of the resources that I go to are APIC and SHEA. Um, we have our government, so we have agencies like the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that we're going to for guidelines, recommendations. We have regulatory agencies, which have the ability of, you know, demanding certain things be met by healthcare facilities, accrediting agencies. So DMV, Joint Commission um, are some of our accrediting agencies, and then scientific research and publications, which, yeah, this is so important scientific research and publications. One of the fav like my favorite thing about my job is the fact that I get to continuously learn. Um, it, is, it is just fantastic that I am learning all the time, um, that there is so much that I don't know, and I'm just so excited to continue to grow in this field. There's so much that we need to learn um, and so much that we need to know as infection preventionists, as epidemiologists working within the healthcare field to try to prevent infections from affecting our patients, our visitors, our staff. It's just fantastic. Elimination of HAIs requires a culture change for healthcare personnel in which no infection is perceived as acceptable by any member of the healthcare team. Support and direction from senior leadership is essential. 
If you don't have a leadership team that is supportive um, of your infection prevention initiatives and that understands the value and that really communicates that out to their other leaders, so you know your CNOs could, you know, disseminating that information to your directors of nursing, which then trickles down to your ANMs, which then trickles down to your frontline staff. You have to have that support, that respect needs to be there and that collaboration needs to be there. Um, that is something that I am extremely grateful for. Um, I, I feel 100% supported by my leadership. And so I think that this is, this is important. And we've talked about the importance of relationships in, in IP before. So make sure you keep those relationships up and that you continue to um, to build them. This support includes implementation of evidence-based practices, alignment of financial incentives, research, acquiring pertinent information, and accountability. All right, so let's talk about the American Hospital Association. The AHA's Advisory Committee on Infections Within Hospitals published its first edition of Infection Control in the Hospital in 1968. The AHA affected infection prevention and control practice through educational programs and conferences, journals, and other publications, briefings, and, consult and consultants. Currently, the AHA issues advisory reports for healthcare executives, keeps track of legislative and regulatory issues regarding HAIs, and maintains its hospitals in pursuit of excellence web-based platform. All right, next one. So the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology. This was established in 1972 to provide education and science-based science -based information to strengthen the practice of infection prevention. It established the Certification Board of Infection Control and Epidemiology in 1981 to administer an infection prevention and control certification program. So APIC is, is, is truly, um, is truly a, a organization that I admire and that um, and that I think we all need to be a part of as infection preventionists um, or epidemiologists working in the field of HAIs. They have a lot of really great resources. They have um, they did this um, mindfulness uh, initiative recently where they were really trying to discuss mental health among the field of infection preventionists, and they had you know, all of these really great resources. In addition to that, they have a big focus on education. They wanna ensure that they're providing um, education on a relatively regular basis to their members. And they have, you know, their their journal on infection prevention. Um, you get those delivered monthly, depending on which um, system you're signed up for, whether electronic or or the delivery method. It's just, it's, it's truly an important organization. and. As stated, they established they established the Certification Board of Infection Control and Epidemiology, which is our certifying body for this test that we're all, you know, hopefully in this group trying to prepare for. Um, I know some of you are getting ready to recertify, and um, you know, we're more than happy to have you here, whether you're getting certified for the first time or getting recertified, etc. All right, our next, our next friends. So the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So DHQP, DHQP, what can I say? I have the utmost respect for DHQP. They're the Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion of the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases. This is the CDC's focus for information, surveillance, investigation, prevention, and control of HAIs. The mission of DHQP is to protect patients, protect healthcare personnel, and promote safety, quality, and value in both national and international healthcare delivery systems. So DHQP is going to be the branch of CDC that your local um, health departments and that you as a facility are going to be collaborating when it comes to infection prevention concerns. Let's say Canada Oris, which we know is not good, right? We know you shouldn't have Burkholderia, you shouldn't have Candida auris. Let's say you start to have an outbreak of Candida auris in your facility. Um, one of the first things you'll you'll want to do is get in touch with your public health partners. 
And one of the things that they're going to do is make sure that they notify their federal partners. So they're going to make sure that they notify um, the division of DHQP. They're they have different types of resources. They have EIS officers that are available to public health staff. Um, they have deployed staff throughout the entire United States that are providing support on the ground to our health departments, um, which then provides support to us, right? They're extremely, extremely important. Um, some of the people that I, I truly admire most in this field work at DHQP, and um, I just, they're fantastic. But so you have to know who they are, right? Uh, you, we have to know who they are. This is why they're, they're included in the text, because they're important. So CDC, oh, let me ask you a quick question. Um, CDC, regulatory, are they a regulatory agency, yes or no? Okay, I'm getting a lot of no's. Good job. <laughs> you guys are like, you tricked us last time. So we're going to make sure you don't trick us this time. Good job. Yes. So they provide recommendations, but they're not regulatory. Very good. Don't let them trick you on the test because they'll try. All right. So CDC surveillance. January 1970, the CDC began the National Nosocomial Infection Surveillance System, the NNIS. The CDC transitioned and NIS to a web-based knowledge system, the National Healthcare Safety Network, in 2005. National surveillance of HAIs is coordinated and analyzed by NHSN. The program publishes HAI rate data. The NHSN data are intended for benchmarking and can be used by institutions in performance improvement activities. So NHSN is really what we're using to compare our trends. Hey, how, how are we doing? Are, we, are our CLABSIs decreasing? Are our CAUDIs decreasing? How are we doing in comparison to other facilities of similar size and of similar patient populations? They, they give you um, the ability to to compare, to benchmark. So, and this is where we report all of our healthcare associated infections, you know, your surgical site infections, your CLABSIs, your CAUDIs, your, um, your VAEs, your lab ID events, all of this stuff gets reported to NHSN. Now I know some of those things, if you are from the public health side, I remember when I was in public health, sometimes it was really difficult for me to fully understand the scope of everything that NHSN is, because we deal with NHSN in a different capacity than, um, you know, than the than a local IP would. Um, but if you're interested, you know, I would say reach out to your HAI program directors, your HAI partners within your state, within your county, and just ask questions. Get get to know the system, see how they see how they use it, how they work with it. Um, and you're more than welcome to look through the lessons that um, CDC posts online on um, NHS and criteria, your basic definitions. Some of it might not totally make sense specifically if you're not working up those infections but it doesn't hurt right to know the more you know the better all right the healthcare <laughs> christy said yes train for your sam's card yes <laughs> all right so the healthcare infection control practices advisory committee the healthcare infection control practices advisory committee or hicpac was established in 1991 the year before I was born, to provide advice and guidance to the CDC and others regarding the practice of infection prevention and control, and strategies for surveillance, prevention, and control of HAIs and antimicrobial resistance. The committee influences infection prevention and control programs through its periodic updating of guidelines and other policy statements. These guidelines are developed in partnerships with various affiliated or professional organizations. So I like to think of HICPAC as this just wonderful place where great minds from multiple institutions are getting together using science to guide us you know they're putting together recommendations they're looking at the research the you know peer-reviewed literature that's available and they're trying their best to ensure that they are providing good recommendations that are evidence-based um, and that um, can really guide infection prevention efforts across multiple settings, right? So I know I know for a lot of this, we focus on acute care, but let's talk about 
dental clinics, ambulatory surgery centers. There is there are so many opportunities for infection preventionists to assist and to help. And I just there's there's just so much. There's so much that we can do. There's so much to do. Do you ever sit down and think about it? Like, do you ever just do you ever think about I wonder if people go into the ambulatory surgery center? Like, because sometimes I do that. Sometimes I'm driving and I'm like, oh, I wonder when their last assessment was, you know, driving past a dental clinic. There's just so much that we need to do for our community. All right, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Hospitals must comply with federal standards that include specific requirements for an active infection prevention and control program. Conditions of participation apply to other healthcare organizations, including ambulatory surgery centers, home health agencies, hospices, um, some providers of outpatient services, and psychiatric hospitals. The standards include requirements to maintain a sanitary environment, designate an infection control officer, and develop, implement, and maintain an active infection prevention and control program. All right, the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. So the FDA is responsible for implementing, monitoring, and enforcing standards for the safety, efficacy, and labeling of all drugs and biologicals for human use. For human use, okay? this. This whole slide, this whole slide is important um, because they're going to find different ways to ask you about the responsibilities of these different agencies. And I can guarantee you that they are going to ask you about responsibilities of the FDA. At least some of you, all of you, I don't know, but at least some of you will get, will get asked about the FDA. So FDA's activities of interest related to infection control, food, blood, medical devices, especially single-use devices, antimicrobial products, and chemical germicides used with medical devices. So they do a lot, all right? Please make sure you review your definitions and that you don't confuse your agencies, right? Don't confuse the FDA with the EPA, right? You have to know what, what they all do. All right, Occupational Safety and Health Administration. The Occupational Sa Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, began its infection prevention and control activities in 1987 with the draft publication of Bloodborne Pathogens Rules. These rules were finalized in 1991. 1991 was a big year for us in infection prevention, huh? All right, so OSHA may enforce other infection prevention issues under the, under the General Duty Clause of the Occupational Safety and Health Act. OSHA standards focus on determining employees' health risks as the result of exposure to communicable disease. Okay, so we know OSHA does bloodborne pathogens, right? We all do our trainings. What else are they responsible for from a regulatory standpoint? We have covered this multiple times. There's another aspect, there's multiple aspects, but what's another big one? Smitha, very good, Smitha. Smitha said respiratory. Very good, yes. Respiratory programs, very good. Okay, so we have three principal goals for infection prevention and control programs. These are our three principal goals. And good job, Sophia. Both Smitha and Sophia wrote respiratory. Okay, so three principal goals for infection prevention and control programs. One, we have to protect the patient. Two, we need to protect the healthcare provider, visitors, and others in the healthcare environment. And three, <laughs> we need to accomplish those two goals in a cost-effective manner whenever possible. So top two, we protect our healthcare staff and we protect the patients. Um, I'll never forget at the start of this pandemic, I was talking with one of our um, pulmonary, uh, our pulmonary docs, and I remember it was in my ICU manager's office and he had a discussion with me and he said, you know, the most important thing in this pandemic is going to be to ensure the safety of our patients, but especially our healthcare workers. He said, the mother hen is responsible for taking care of all of the baby chicks. 
if we don't have a mother hen, the baby chicks are left on their own and they will have no protection, they'll have no shelter, they'll have nobody to care for them. And he said, every single healthcare provider is a mother hen. So we need to ensure their protection. Um, and that resonated a lot with me. So we have to protect our mother hens so that we can protect our patients, right? So protect your patient, protect your healthcare personnel, your visitors and others in your healthcare environment, and then do it in a way where you're not you know, breaking the bank. All right, the four principal functions of an infection prevention and control program. So, number one, to obtain and manage critical data and information, including surveillance for infections. Number two, to develop and recommend policies and procedures. There's been a lot of that. <laughs> There's been a lot of that happening. Lots of recommendations. <laughs> Um, number three, to intervene directly to prevent infection and interrupt the transmission of infectious diseases. To intervene directly to prevent infections and interrupt the transmission of infectious diseases. To educate and train healthcare personnel, patients, and non medical givers. Sorry, caregivers. And non medical caregivers. So those are our four principal functions of an infection prevention and control program. So what about our IP team? Often the core of the infection prevention and control program is the infection preventionist, chair of the infection prevention committee, and the healthcare epidemiologist. The infection prevention team is responsible for carrying out all aspects of the infection prevention and control program. Team members must also be qualified and guided by sound principles and current information. We want to be as current as possible. It should set goals, collect and analyze data, and select interventions. A facility may have an infection prevention committee that functions as the central decision making and policy making body for infection prevention. Okay, so how many of you have a local infection prevention committee? So you have an infection prevention committee like at your specific hospital. You're not part of a larger system that has like a you know, a, a huge, big, huge, big, really, uh, a, a large, <laughs> a large infection prevention committee. Uh, okay, so yes, we do, we have it. Okay, okay, so Sherilyn says that she has both a local one and a system one. That's fantastic. Good job, Sherilyn. That's great. So we know that our infection prevention committees are really important. Um, they play a big role in a lot of the decisions that are going to be disseminated to your hospital system um, and that will essentially affect our patients, our frontline staff, everyone. They're very important and they're multidisciplinary. We want people from all over, right? We want people from, from you know, one of the things that, that I just, that is just so great about being an infection preventionist is you get to work with so many different people, right? You get to have all of these really wonderful relationships with your campus leaders. You know your EVS director, you know who's in charge of respiratory, you're having discussions with your ID physicians, you're talking to your CNO, you're talking to your um, director of, of the VAST team, the vascular team, there are so many different people that you are connected with and all of those people make up your multidisciplinary team that can allow you to achieve, um, you know, the safest environment possible for your patients and for your healthcare staff. So yes, it's really important. Oh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. So the, the Infection Prevention Committee, the Infection Prevention Committee acts as the advocate for prevention and control of infections in the facility, formulates and monitors patient care policies, educates staff, and provides political support that empowers the team. The IPC must be multidisciplinary, composed of representatives from appropriate departments, such as nursing, admin, engineering, pharmacy, building management, EBS. It should meet regularly, usually monthly or quarterly or um, quarterly. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, guys, we're gonna have to take a quick pause. This laptop is gonna die. Let's not have this happen again. Give me a second.
Okay, can you guys hear me? I might sound a little different. Yes, okay, sorry. Last time um, my laptop died, the recording didn't save. So I would rather sound a little odd than the recording not save at all. Okay. All right, perfect. Okay, because infection prevention issues and measures often cross departmental lines, an IPC that is multidisciplinary is crucial. And we really kind of have done a good job at explaining why it's so important. Okay, so infection prevention professionals. IP and the healthcare epidemiologists. The IP predominantly has a background in nursing, medical technology, microbiology, or public health. Um, I do know that there are also infection preventionists who um, have, a have a background in respiratory, respiratory care, which that's also very interesting. And I think with time, as we see our field grow and expand, we're gonna, we're gonna have different people joining the team and bringing different areas of expertise to, um, to the field of infection prevention. The IP typically functions as a consultant, educator, role model, researcher, and change agent. Infection prevention and control responsibilities include education, consultation, surveillance, implementation science, patient safety, and quality improvement. Now, I'm not gonna go over staffing. We literally have done a whole presentation on staffing. They discuss staffing in chapter one, um, but you can go back and you can view the, our lecture on YouTube or you can um, look through the links um, because we've already talked about staffing. All right, cost effectiveness versus cost benefit. Cost effectiveness and cost benefit are examples of decision analysis studies. Effectiveness refers to the outcome of care. It can be expressed as the number of cases of disease prevented, the number of lives saved, or the number of life years saved. Cost benefit analysis looks at outcomes in terms of cost. Benefits other than direct financial costs are also important in evaluating the impact of infection prevention activities. These include decreasing malpractice claims, protecting, employee from urge, from, protecting employees from injury, assisting in patient safety efforts, and enhancing the organization's image. Influencing practice. Written infection prevention policies are often developed that relate to staff and patient care practices, construction, renovation, emergency management, occupational health, and sterilization and disinfection. These policies must be supported by scientifically and, and address the infection prevention needs for the institutions. Mm. I would rather say these policies must be supported by scientific research and address the infection prevention needs for the institution. Education of staff is crucial to the success of any infection prevention and control program. Okay, I think this is so important. So we're not in the education chapter yet. Um, so I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna talk for too long, especially since we need to get moving, but I would pay attention and I would have some discussions about what the education budget is going to look like. Um, a lot of health systems have suffered um, due to COVID-19. And um, I would I would have some discussions if if you know your leaders and you know who you talk to about what education is going to look like. I my one of my biggest fears is that we're gonna move away from some of our really active methods of learning. So from um, you know competency assessment, having them perform and and have like an actual in-person ability to report to skills fairs and moving to a more there's already there's there is already so much that has been moved to an you know an online based type of platform um that i'm really concerned about about health systems even cutting back more on education when i think that this pandemic has brought to light the importance and the necessity for education to be a absolutely top priority for healthcare organizations. And I'm not just talking about them sitting through computer-based learning modules for hours at a time. We know that not all of that information is retained. You have to be able to get in front of people to have educators accessible to 
go over Foley insertion, blood specimen collection, all of these different things, you know, that personal component is really important. So I would just, you know, find out what is the plan um, for education um, and make sure that you're having discussions around that because it's important. All right, quality of an infection prevention and control program. The interdisciplinary infection prevention team determines goals and objectives for the infection prevention and control program by performing an annual risk assessment. Identification of high volume, high risk, and problem prone activities is an important component of the risk assessment. Infection prevention resources and data system needs to be needs should be evaluated in the context of these goals and objectives. The risk assessment can assist in setting priorities and obtaining support from key stakeholders. Okay, so we made good time. Question one. Now remember, you just have to type into the questions box. IP managers are individuals who plan, organize, direct, control, and coordinate activities in order to move the organization toward A, economic stability, B, Desired objectives, C, higher profits, or D, greater social influence. Okay, very good. So I have. I have a lot of Bs. I have a lot of desired objectives, which is great because that's the correct answer. So let's read our rationale. The overall role of a manager is to guide organization, organizations towards accomplishing goals. The six basic functions of managers include planning, organizing, staffing, leading, controlling, and motivating. Question two. Which of the following is the most important reason for having an infection prevention and control committee? A, the IPC is necessary to justify the IP's position. B, the IPC is a vehicle for communication and consensus building. C, the IPC function is required by the Joint Commission. Or D, the IPC can replace the organization's safety committee. Okay, so we have the majority of answers are between B and C. Okay, so at least we're narrowing down, that's good. Okay, so from the responses, it seems like you guys narrowed out A and D, you got rid of those two. The IPC is necessary to justify the IP's position. Um, that is, that yeah, good job getting rid of that one, because no. The IPC can replace the organization safety committee. There's a lot of things that safety looks at that infection prevention doesn't necessarily look at. Now, patient safety and infection control, we like to work hand in hand, right? But patient safety has their specific focus. Um, if we were all looking at the same thing, <laughs> then we would probably have a different name. Um, you know, they're looking at false risks, they're looking at medication errors, they're looking at uh, they, they, okay, they literally look at so many different things. Um, so an infection prevention committee is not able to replace an organization safety committee. It's like, no. So good job, you crossed those two out. So most of you are stuck between B and C. The IPC is a, ve is a vehicle for communication and consensus building, or C, the IPC function is required by the Joint Commission. Now, the CIC test, they like to do this so much. What is the most important thing? What would you do first? 
blah, blah, blah. They have all of these little words that they like to use. So when they're using these words, they're trying to ensure that you understand major concepts of the chapter. When we were talking about the Infection Prevention Committee, we talked about the importance of it being a multidisciplinary committee because we need to have input from a lot of different um, partners within healthcare to ensure that we are doing the best thing possible for patients and for staff. As an IP, we could have a ton of ideas, right? And then we bring it to the Infection Prevention Committee and they're like, that's a great idea, but we don't have this, 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 we don't have the resources for, for X, Y, and Z. Um, these are gonna be our limitations. Fantastic, we may not be able to do that, but this is what we can do. So if you understand what the IPC committee does and how important they are, you'll be led to the correct answer, which is that the IPC is a vehicle for communication and, consens and consensus building. Now, are there requirements for us to have these infection prevention committees? Absolutely, but that is not the most important reason for having them. That is not their sole purpose. These agencies want us to have these committees so that we are able to communicate, so that we are able to brainstorm, solve problems, and, and have a forum to exchange ideas and knowledge. So, again, remember, they're, they're, you have to, what are they asking you? What are they asking you? They're asking you, do you know why these, these committees are so important? Why the Infection Prevention Committee is so important? That's the actual question. So the Infection Prevention Committee functions as the central decision-making and policy-making body for infection prevention. The IPC often ratifies and refines the ideas of the infection prevention teams. Its members disseminate the information discussed in the meeting. We have a comment from Hayden. Hayden says, members should come up, should, members should come up a consensus and later formulate policy to be reinforced. Perfect. All right, question three. Strategic planning includes all of the following steps, except A, action planning. B, defining the common purpose for all departmental activities. C, an analysis of the organization. Or D, forming conclusions about what an organization must do. Okay, so every answer choice was selected for this one. Um, and I would say they're about, they're pretty even. I, I do see a little bit of, I do see quite a bit of a D. And a lot of D with like a question mark after, like is a D? Maybe it could be. Um, but every answer choice was selected. Okay, so the correct answer is defining the common purpose for all departmental activities. So we are strategic planning. We are strategic planning. So strategic planning is an organization's process of defining its strategy or direction and making decisions on allocating its resources to pursue this strategy. Steps integral to the, pro to the process include determine when you are, identify what is important, refine what you must achieve, sorry, define, <laughs> define what you must achieve, determine who is accountable and review, oh, oh no, I'm missing the rest of this. I need to make sure I add this. Um, there's a fifth one that we're missing and I believe it's an important one, so I do apologize <laughs> for missing this one. And Joseph said all the answers are B tonight. 
<laughs> but we're strategic planning, right? So we're trying to define a strategy and we're trying to choose a direction. We're trying to make a decision on what type of resources we're, we're gonna allocate. Now, action planning makes sense and analysis of the organization makes sense. Forming conclusions about what an organization must do, right? Because they're trying, they're trying to get, you're trying to get to a specific place. This is why you're strategic planning. Now, defining the common purpose of our, all departmental activities. Um, I can see why I can see um, I can see why you would be inclined to think that that might be a portion of strategic planning, but I think it's too broad. It's too broad of an answer um, to really get us to where we're going with strategic planning. Um, and I will make sure that when I send out my email, I include number five, which is in chapter one. So I do apologize. Okay, question four. Let's see how we're doing on time. We're doing okay on time. Okay, good. Question four. The IP receives a call from the Food and Drug Administration <laughs> with an official request for private health information about a patient who was admitted to the facility with botulism. How should the IP respond to this call? A, tell the FDA officer that she cannot share PHI with the FDA due to Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act regulations. B, ask the FDA to contact the local health department to obtain information about the patient. C, provide the FDA officer with the minimum amount of information necessary related to the patient or D, transfer the call to the risk management department. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So Dakota said, I want a choice that says gather more information. <laughs> um, hold the phone. <laughs> Let me just, excuse me, <laughs> who are you? Okay, so let's see. We have, okay, so the majority of people are selecting C. Um, I have, okay, every answer choice is selected again. So, but it, it does seem like the majority of the group is, is moving, it's like moving towards C. There's quite a bit of C's, um, quite a bit of D's. B I mean, there's just everybody chose chose this. They ch you chose every answer. The group is there's a lot of all answers choices were selected. All right, the the correct answer is provide the FDA officer with the minimum minimum amount of information necessary related to the patient. So, um, I don't know exactly, I, I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to realistically think like how I would feel if I said infection prevention, this is loose, and somebody was like, hey, I'm Susie May with the FDA, I'm calling regarding a botulism patient that you have in your intensive care unit, I'm trying to, you know, you're thinking of how you would respond to these things. Now, I know from working in public health, when I used to work at the health department, um, that we are protected by certain laws, right? When you work in the field of public health regarding um, patients' private information. And a lot of the time, um, you had to, you know, I had to fax out the specific sheet. And I'm referring to Florida right now, right? Because I've only worked in Florida um, ever in my life. I was gonna say within the field of public health, but then no, like this is it. This is the place where I've always worked. Um, and so I would I would email them this sheet that had our different laws and I would go over um, the state's rules regarding patient information for reportable diseases and conditions. And that sheet would basically outline that because we are the health department, um, we need to ensure that we're getting this information and we don't abide by the same rules that other um, private agencies or corporations, um, you know, we don't have, we don't have to submit that, that request for, for records the same way other places would, right? Um, 
And so because of that experience, I would lean towards C. But this is but but this is going based off experience alone, right? Um, I would not do this to my risk manager. I would not transfer to risk management. Um, I know that we have certain public health rules that allow this. Um, and I would honestly, if I was taking the test today, this is these are the two answer choices that I would have been leaning towards, either B or C. You know, ask the FDA to contact our local public health department to obtain to obtain information about the patient. But let's look at our rationale. So the FDA is a public health authority. HIPAA regulations cover disclosure to the FDA of the minimum of the minimum amount of information necessary to prevent or control diseases. And you're able to go on this when you when you click on this link, um, which I'm not going to do because I don't know how to get back to the PowerPoint. Like we've been through this, right? Loose struggles with technology. Um, you can read more about it. But this is the reason why, sorry, C is going to be your correct answer. But remember, we always talk about this. Try to narrow your answer choices. Try to narrow your answer choices as best as possible. You can almost always at least cross out one, if not two answers. Unless it's something that you're, you know, totally clueless on. And if that is the case, let me tell you what, make your best educational guess and keep it moving. I have told you this, do not waste your time on your questions. It is a timed test. Do not run out of time on your test. Okay, question five. Which of the following would be an appropriate method to evaluate the quality of an infection prevention program? A, the total number of areas where surveillance was carried out in the past year. B, the average amount of time that elapsed between receiving reports from the lab about patients with multidrug resistant infections and placing those patients on appropriate isolation precautions. C, the number of IPs in the program for the number of beds. Or D, the average amount of money spent on isolation gowns this year as compared to last year. <laughs> <laughs> Krista, Krista, that's the reason I was laughing, because um, for so for answer choice D, we have the average amount of money spent on isolation gowns this year as compared to last year. Could you imagine <laughs> comparing 2019 to 2020? I don't even know. Yeah, it would be. She said for this year, D would be huge. <laughs> okay so let's see what answer choices we've selected we have okay so we have it narrowed down to a b and c all right so almost everybody immediately crossed out d good good we're we're eliminating answers the narrower the options the happier i am because it means that you guys are critically thinking and getting rid of answer choices that don't truly make sense all right so which, would, which of the following would be an appropriate method to evaluate the quality of an infection prevention program? So B, the average amount of time that elapsed between receiving reports from the lab about patients with multidrug resistant infections and placing those patients on isolation precautions. The quality of infection prevention program should be, the quality of the infection prevention program should be assessed routinely by evaluating customer satisfaction, appropriateness, efficacy, timeliness, availability, effectiveness, and efficiency. Like, that's a lot of ease. All right, the average amount of time that elapsed between receiving reports from the lab about patients with um, MDROs and placing those patients on appropriate isolation precautions relates to timeliness of initiating appropriate interventions. Therefore, it can be used as a quality measure for the program. Okay. Question six, if you have to hop off, that's okay, but let's go ahead and finish this out. We're almost done, and I always usually run about like Three minutes over so that's fine all right question six an early level ip a novice ip in your department has set a goal of advancing to achieve middle level or proficient competency within the next year which of the following activities would be the most appropriate to include on her personal development plan for the year 
one, nominating herself or himself, you know, for the president-elect position of the local APIC chapter, taking the certification and infection control exam within six months, requesting information about a Master of Science in Epidemiology degree, or four, learning the basics of CAUTI surveillance. So now you have your different options. You choose which numbers you believe um, are appropriate for a proficient competency um, plan, going from novice to proficient. All right, let's see what we're working with here. Hmm. Okay, lots of variants. I have almost every answer choice selected. No, I do. I have all A, B, C, and D selected. Okay, there should be automatically one that we can get rid of. And that's going to be learning the basics of CAUTI surveillance. So at the point where you're ready, to move to a proficient competency level, you want to ensure that you have your basics down for infection prevention. You know, some of the, the things that you're going to learn within your first three months of the job on the job are going to be your um, isolation list, um, your isolation rounding, working up infections. This is, of course, if you don't get hired in the middle of a pandemic, because then you know what? It's all hands on deck and you're just going to have to go with the flow and we will teach you as we go because it was madness. But usually you have, you know, a set guideline for those first three months. Now these other three, this is taking on a leadership position. This is gaining your competency. And this is requesting um, to get a higher level degree, um, specifically within a field that is really important to infection prevention, which is epidemiology. So APIC has created a competency model to help guide the advancement of infection preventionists in the field. The three levels of competency are early level, middle level, and advanced level, or novice, proficient, and expert. The competency levels can be used to guide goal setting activities as part of the IP's personal development plan. Middle level competencies include being certified in infection control, which is extremely important. I cannot emphasize the importance of certification. Considering an, an advanced degree in the field and being active in the local APIC chapter by serving in a leadership position. Okay, I think we're over time, so let me see. Um, I'll just, let's just go through this one really quick. Which of the following need, need to be considered when updating the annual infection risk assessment? One, an evaluation of the previous year's goals and objectives. Two, an identification of risk based on geographic location, community, and population served. Three, risks related to the type of services that, I, that the facility provides. Or four, a broad assessment of all risks identified in the facility. So this is going to be which of the following need to be considered when you're updating your annual infection risk assessment. And it's going to be one, two, and three. Um, so we're going to go ahead and stop here. We are in our survey window. And so we're going to have to um, put the group on pause for the next two weeks. I know that that's not ideal, um, but I'm sure that you guys understand um, that unfortunately, we just kind of have to put the, the group on pause. If I am able to find a substitute that can cover the subjects for the next two weeks, then I will um, do so. But you know, we're in that period where we just got to really buckle down. Um, and I know many of you are as well. I just got a message. We are also, yes, many of us are in the, many of us are losing our hair right now. Our edges are receding um, and that's okay. You know, hopefully they'll grow back. Um, <laughs> um, yes. So does anybody have any questions before we sign off? Anything that I can answer? Cause I know I'm not the best re responding to email, but that's just because, um, well, I have a full-time job. I volunteer for this group. I have three dogs. It's a mess. Um, I, I do my best. I try when I can, but anything, anything I can answer right now. Okay. Um, you're going to have a much easier time reaching me on LinkedIn. I always say that because I can just, it's like text messaging. I can just message you back real quick. Um, um, 
or sometimes it might take me a day or two. And if it does, that's better because sometimes it could take me a week or two to get back to your email. So, all right, I don't see any questions. Happy weekend. Um, thank you so much, Dakota. Appreciate you all and happy studying. Good luck to those of you who are getting ready to sit for your exam. Um, I am so very proud of all of you who are doing this in the middle of a pandemic. You guys are amazing. Um, and Sherilyn, if I cannot find someone, um, then I will be sending out an email, making sure you guys know of the cancellation, okay? Because um, the only other person I, I, I would hope could do it, I think she's she's getting ready for you know some finals at the moment, um, which would be Danielle Rankin. But I will let you guys know. Okay, thank you guys and have a good weekend.